Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for tonight's Black History Month webinar, sponsored by the Center for African and African American Studies in the Department of Anthropology at Rice. Uh, my name is Mary Prendergast. I'm in the Anthropology Department at Rice. Um, and before I introduce our speaker for this evening, um, I'll remind you to please just use the Q&A box if you wish to submit a question during the talk. Those will be visible to the panelists um, and not to others. And then at the end of the talk, um, Adrian Rooney, a PhD candidate in art history at Rice will moderate the Q&A session. Uh, it's a real honor for me tonight to be able to introduce somebody whom I admire very much, Professor Susan McIntosh. She is the Herbert S. Autry Professor in Anthropology at Rice. Um, and many of you from the rights community will know her as the recent interim dean of social sciences, a position she held for two years, uh, helping us navigate through this pandemic. Professor McIntosh has been at Rice for nearly four decades. Um, and during her time here, she has helped build a program that is widely recognized globally as one of the strongest in African archaeology, and particularly in its training of new generations of scholars. She has trained students from Mali, Nigeria, and Senegal who have gone on to become leaders in their fields and in the protection of African cultural heritage. As the co-director of the Gene Geno Archaeological Project in Mali, she uh, uh, began scholarship that set a new way forward for thinking about the ancient African city. And her work influenced worldwide archaeological debates about the origins of urban complex societies and states, helping put Africa into a global discourse in which the continent's history was often overlooked. She has worked extensively at other urban sites in West Africa, in the inland Niger Delta and the middle Senegal Valley, and helped shape our understanding of early roots of the Trans-Saharan trade networks. She's published seven books, dozens of articles, and is widely recognized as a leading authority in African archaeology, and has served the Africanist professional community through her many leadership positions over the years in our professional societies and our editorial boards. And finally, and perhaps most pertinent to tonight's lecture, she served for two terms as a presidential appointee from 1996 to 2003 on a committee that advised the United States president and the State Department on the protection of international cultural heritage and the implementation of the 1970 UNESCO Convention. Tonight, Professor McIntosh will speak to us on a topic that is gaining renewed urgency as curating institutions and state governments, such as those of France and Germany, evaluate the colonial origins of their African collections and begin considering processes of repatriation and, re and restitution. Her talk is entitled Repatriating Africa's Looted Heritage, Progress and Process. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor McIntosh. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for those very kind words. And I also want to thank Professor Pin, Tony, for the invitation to present on this final day of Black History Month. I am both pleased and honored to be able to speak on a topic that I am so passionate about, African cultural heritage. So I'll just share my screen now. Uh, over the past several years, the cause of repatriation of Africa's cultural heritage held in global North museums has gained remarkable momentum. The push to return African cultural objects has become a global movement bringing long-awaited action to the quest initiated decades ago by newly independent African nations. French President Emmanuel Macron's pledge in 2017 to return African heritage to Africa galvanized the movement, and this received a further impetus by the report of the committee that Macron created to study repatriation. The 2018 Savoy Sa report recommended repatriation upon request by African governments. Senegal, Mali, Chad, Ivory Coast, Ethiopia, and Madagascar have already submitted claims for restitution to France. And last year, France has returned 26 items from the Kingdom of Dahomey to Benin. More recently, Dan Hicks widely publicized 2020 book, The Brutish Museums, focuses on the Benin bronzes to argue that decolonization of museums requires the repatriation of looted materials that perpetuate the Eurocentric and racist narratives resident in museum displays. Nigeria has subsequently secured agreements from a significant number of museums in the US, Ireland, Scotland, and Germany for return of materials in their collections that were looted from the Royal Palace in Benin City 
during the British punitive expedition of 1897. While it is certainly true, as Hicks and others have argued, that this dramatic shift in cultural politics is linked to broader movements protesting memorials to white supremacy and colonialism, for example, demands for the removal of Confederate memorials in the US and statues of colonial icons such as Cecil Rhodes in South Africa, and that it is also linked to movements calling for racial justice and an end to anti-Black violence. I want to highlight in this talk how the accelerating pace of restitution rests on a foundation of decades long development and implementation of international agreements and procedural mechanisms for repatriation of cultural property. For example, ethical curation protocols for rigorous provenance research into the source of cultural items in collections and procedures for appropriate restitution were developed in the 1990s as part of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, NAGPRA, and also the Washington Principles on Nazi Confiscated Art. Provenance research is the essential first step in consideration of any quest for return, request for return of cultural materials. And museums considering restitution today employ standards developed over the past three decades. In the remainder of this talk, I want to focus on the foundational role played by the 1970 UNESCO Convention, has a very long title, here we go, on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property, which I will hereafter refer to as simply the Convention or the UNESCO Convention. The Convention was formulated in 1970 as many recently independent countries realized that it would require international agreement and assistance to prevent continuation of the appropriation and sale of cultural patrimony that colonial powers had engaged in with impunity. The convention identified prevention of trafficking as a key priority, but also contained provisions for restitution. It provided the legal foundation and codification of principles that enabled two remarkable instances of repatriation of cultural items to Mali just in the past three months. In December 2021, over 900 pottery and stone artifacts from archaeological sites that had been seized by U.S. Customs were returned to the state, uh, to, to Mali by the State Department. And here you see them as they were in the um, customs warehouse in the port of Houston. I'll say a little bit more about that later. And earlier this month, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts signed an agreement with Mali to voluntarily return two terracotta statuettes that were illegally exported to Mali, exported from Mali and bought by a private collector in the 1990s who then bequeathed them to the museum. Both these repatriation efforts were initiate a initiated a decade or more ago, but were delayed by political instability in Mali. Uh, my perspective on the UNESCO Convention is informed my, by my participation, as Mary mentioned, um, from 1996 to 2003 as a member of the advisory committee that is charged with making recommendations on requests for US protection under the, con under the convention. At that time, voluntary repatriation by a major museum was almost unimaginable. So I offer a perspective on the major changes that have occurred over the 20 years since I began my first term on the committee. I have also been significantly involved in different capacities with both the repatriation cases just mentioned. My primary research area is the middle stretch of the Niger River. In particular, the Inland Delta, circled in red, which is the area that has produced the most highly sought after antiquities. Many of these are stylistically distinctive and impressively crafted terracotta statuettes. The Inland Niger Delta is an area that has been central to strategic control of Niger River transport by all three of the great West African empires. Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. 
centers for trade, production, supply, and transport, such as Jenne, were important nodes linked to trans-Saharan trade. So the history of this area is absolutely central to African history and the documentation of Black achievement in pre-colonial West Africa, a point that Michael Gomez made in his recent book, African Dominion. This is why the UNESCO Convention's concern with preventing looting and trafficking, rather than solely focusing on restitution, is so critical for me as an archaeologist. And also, I believe, for the project of replacing conjectural histories for Africa's pre-colonial past with histories based in evidence. This is a region for which there is no written accounts before the ninth century CE, when chroniclers writing in Arabic began to mention sub-Saharan locales, although they did so often in sketchy, ambiguous, and sometimes very contradictory terms. Even in the fourth, 14th century, a traveler like Ibn Battuta recorded such hazy details about his itinerary to the capital of Mali that historians have variously located it in modern Senegal, Guinea, or Mali. Local histories written in Arabic by Sahelian elites in Jenny and Timbuktu generally date to the 17th century or later. And by Sahil, I mean the semi-arid transition zone be between the Sahara Desert and the Savannah. Oral histories still exist in various areas of the Sahil, but these have been extensively overwritten by centuries of Islamic learning and practice. So the primary source for pre-colonial history of these areas is archeology. span In the inland Delta, permanent settlements are on man-made mounds that elevate occupation above the annual floods. And you see here flood stage at the city of Jenny, um, where the very famous mosque, uh, iconic uh, Sudanic style mosque in solid mud, seven stories high. Thanks to the elevation of these mounds, we can identify archeological sites in the floodplain using aerial and satellite imagery. Here are the known archeological mounds in an approximately 10 to 12 kilometer area around Jenne, which is this blue dot here, mapped onto Google Earth imagery. Until the 1970s, as best we can tell, destructive forces affecting these mounds were mainly wind and rain erosion and the farmers who might plant millet or mango trees on the mounds. These mounds were largely unmolested by digging for artifacts for a simple reason. Some French colonial administrators had sunk a few trenches into abandoned mounds around Jenny and found nothing of interest. Presumably they hoped for, but did not find, rich tombs, epigraphy, or monumental architecture. Only masses of broken pottery and mud brick building foundations that they did not know how to study and interpret and certainly did not value. In fact, the archeology span of West Africa was marginalized and under-researched throughout the colonial period and well into the post-colonial period for precisely these regions. Inland Delta archeological sites began to come under the threat of looting in the 1970s when terracottas from the Jenne area became increasingly attractive to collectors. This was happening at a time when authentic African ethnographic objects, and by that I mean objects created for and used in traditional ceremonies and rituals, became scarce in the post-colony. African entrepreneurs were creating a steady stream of objects that they distressed to look as if they had been used for decades. Collectors became wary. Archeological items took on a new value as they seemed reliably authentic and of some antiquity. This coincided broadly with the elevation of what was previously termed primitive or tribal art to the status of fine art by the Metropolitan Museum's decision to create a new wing devoted to it. The Michael C. Rockefeller Wing of African, Oceanic and Pre-Columbian Art opened in 1982. The 1980s and 90s were a period during which archeological sites in the inland Niger Delta were quarried for statuettes to a catastrophic extent. 
The soaring prices for terracottas enabled local middlemen serving major dealers to hire scores of men, seen here on the right, to dismantle archeological mounds in their entirety. This is just part of a team that might number up to 100 men trenching their way through sites. Individual looters would dig individual uh, tunnel mounds. In 1991, Sotheby's offered this terracotta ram for sale and ignored Molly's request to withdraw it from the auction in view of evidence that it was recently looted and illegally exported. A Dutch inventory of sites in the Inland Delta with evidence of recent looting made the disastrous scale of the destruction clear. And on the left, we see mounds visited by the survey team. And this is in an area of about 75 kilometers length between Jenne and Mopti along the Bani and Niger rivers. And on the right, that same area with mapping mounds with evidence of looting, the larger circles indicate mounds were affected uh, by over 70% of the, the mound surface. Um, the remaining 400 kilometer length of the Niger floodplain to the north has not been surveyed. In the face of such destruction of its archeological patrimony, Mali re uh, requested protection from the US under the UNESCO convention in 1993. So some brief background on how the US has implemented the convention is relevant here. In 1992, the United States became the first major art importing country to ratify the convention with the proviso that implementing legislation would be required. The United States was not going to implement all 26 articles of uh, the convention. Drafting the implementing legislation took 11 years of exhausting and contentious skirmishes in Congress with the art dealer community. The National Association of Dealers in Ancient Oriental and Primitive Art claimed on their website as of 1999 that its members were instrumental in crafting the Cultural Property Implementation Act, CPIA, passed by Congress in 1982. The CPIA implemented only one of the convention's 14 articles dealing specifically with actions and responsibilities of signatory countries with regard to illicit traffic in cultural patrimony. The CPIA does the following in respect of Article 9 of the convention. It identifies import restrictions as a remedy when national patrimony is in jeopardy sets out conditions for bilateral, multilateral, or emergency unilateral action, and creates a committee, the CPAC, to review requests for protection from member, other members, signatory states. And as Mary mentioned, I was appointed by President Clinton to the CPAC for two terms. I served with two other archeologists and eight members representing the interests of art dealers, museums, and the general public. Our role was to review the voluminous documentation that requesting countries were required to provide in support of their request and decide whether that documentation uh, provided adequate evidence to support four essential determinations specified in the CPIA. Since import restrictions would be the consequence of a positive recommendation on the four determinations, you may imagine how energetically the art dealers on the committee contested each point. On the first point, you know, in most cases, the pillage referred to is taking place at archeological sites, though pillage through theft from religious sites and buildings and museums may be involved. The recurring points of contention raised by the uh, members, the art dealer members, how do we know the pillage is currently occurring? This is a particular problem for requesting countries where looting by vaqueros or tamboroli is a tradition going back a century or more. Dealers wanted to know, how do you know those holes are actually recent? This is where Mali offered very little ambiguity or opportunities for denial of recent looting. Digging for terracottas only began in earnest after 1975. In face of 
overwhelming evidence for recent and ongoing looting in Mali, CPAC responded to Mali's request for protection with a recommendation for immediate implementation of unilateral emergency restrictions on inland Delta antiquities in 1993. A second determination, also a frequent point of contention. How substantial do the measures taken have to be? Are any measures, however modest, sufficient? What standards should we use? We debated that one endlessly for virtually every request that came in. That the, this reflects um, a, a belief, a cultural belief, that cultural objects have universal value and should not be sequestered in source countries. Dealers obviously would like objects to circulate via the marketplace, but programs of loans to museums, both temporary and long-term, and traveling exhibitions can meet these concerns and should be addressed in the documentation. Mali has loaned numerous items um, since 2019 for two major exhibits, one on caravans of gold that started at the Block Museum in the Northwestern, traveled to the Aga Khan, I believe it's currently at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. Um, and then the Metropolitan had a major exhibit on the Sahel and kingdoms of the Sahel. And fourth, that import restrictions have a good upper chance of working and other alternatives wouldn't. This was a huge bone of contention in the 1980s and 90s when the US was the only major market country who had ratified and implemented the convention. If the US imposed import restrictions, the cul cultural pillage would surely continue and simply flow to other markets, it was argued. This argument ceased to have any salience as the other major Western market countries ratified and implemented the UNESCO convention. Another point frequently raised by the dealers was that import restrictions by the US amounted to the US enforcing another country's export restrictions when that country was just doing a poor job of it. They got a lot less traction on these objections once exposés were published documenting the lengths that dealers and highly respected museums such as the Getty and the Met went to to smuggle antiquities out of source countries. One important consequence of these embarrassing exposés was the creation of compliance and provenance offices in all major auction houses and museums, and also the development of museum codes of ethics. The voluntary repatriation of the terracottas by the Boston uh, MFA this month can be credited to the meticulous work by their provenance curator, Victoria Reed. As a measure of how dramatically things have changed since I was on the CPAC, these same statuettes were the focus of a request for repatriation to Mali in 1998, when they were loaned by that same donor for an exhibit in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, New Africa, Oceania, and Pre-Columbian Gallery. When the museum director rebuffed that request from the Malian embassy, I flew my former graduate student, Taraba Togola, who was at that time director of cultural patrimony in Mali, to Boston to meet with the museum director and make the request in person. The director simply refused to receive Dr. Togola for the meeting. Unimaginable today, common practice 20 years ago. The US bilateral accords have steadily gained momentum after a slow start, shall we say, in the first 17 years of the CPIA. And I think that the gathering momentum is, uh, uh, reflects the fact that import restrictions, once an agreement is in place, have really important effects. This is what they can do. And this is very significant, particularly to source countries such as Mali, who are poor. We can hardly overstate what this means to them, because absent 
protection under the CPIA, countries would have to engage in lengthy and prohibitively expensive legal battles to get their cultural property returned. And only then, if they can definitely prove it was stolen, this can be really hard to do with archeological materials ripped from the ground by looters. The objects haven't been documented and photographed or accessioned by museums, but this kind of not documentation is necessary under the stolen property statutes that they would have to pursue. Turkey, for example, spent several hundred thousand dollars in legal fees in the 1980s to get back the stunning Lydian hoard a voluminous collection, hundreds of gold, silver, and bronze hollowware items and jewelry looted from tombs dating to the sixth century BCE and bought by the Metropolitan Museum in New York just weeks after the looting took place. The Met finally admitted after six years that they knew the material was stolen after Turkey was able to demonstrate that the wall painting fragments at the Met exactly match the spots where wall paintings were cut out of the tomb. The Met returned the items to Turkey in 1993. The Malian artifacts that were returned in December, on the other hand, are a good example of how the CPIA restrictions work. A shipment came into the Port of Houston in 2009. It listed recent cultural artifacts and reproductions destined for a gallery in the Southwest um, on the shipping list. The custom agents in Houston had coincidentally just finished a training workshop given by the Department of State to acquaint officers with the source countries and materials protected under the CPIA. They knew that the US had a bilateral accord with Mali and they knew the shipment originated in Mali. So they went to the quite extraordinary trouble of unpacking the massive shipping crates and unwrapping the items from their protective bubble wrap. They then called me in as an expert in Malian antiquities to assess the materials and see if any belonged to restricted archeological categories. There were a lot of recent wooden carved objects, but there were also items that I immediately recognized as pottery and stone tools from sites along the Niger River, specifically large funerary urns, painted pottery, and masses of stone tools. I also recognized stone carvings from Nigeria, but the US had no accord with Nigeria at the time, so they were not subject to restrictions. I wrote my detailed report and knew that customs would be conducting inquiries as to why none of the archeological artifacts were included on the export permission from Mali. I then heard no more until I read about the repa repatriation uh, at the end of last year in the New York Times and Smithsonian Magazine. You may imagine how delighted I was to know about it. As reparations under the convention have become more common, the cost to dealers, collectors, and muse museums has risen dramatically. France has repatriated thousands of artifacts to Mali that they've intercepted at the border. For Mali, these import restrictions combined with their own internal efforts to control looting, install guards on major archeological sites and educate their population on the protection of archaeological patrimony have been remarkably effective. Looting at archaeological sites within a 40 kilometer radius of Jenny had been virtually halted throughout the 2000s when I was able to visit the area. That was no longer possible after 2012 when Islamist extremists linked to Al Qaeda and the Islamic State infiltrated Northern Mali and the government fell in a coup d'etat. Since then, the Islamist factions have multiplied and gained control of the entire Middle Niger region, including the Inland Niger Delta. In other areas where ISIS is active, Libya, Iraq, Syria, they have systematically pillaged sites for antiquities to sell. So I'm deeply concerned about the fate of the archeological sites. What drives the destruction of sites by looting is the desire for antique cultural artifacts. 
beautiful things from the past. And the market is happy to fill that desire. But the objects alone ripped from the context in which they were created, used, or deposited actually tell us remarkably little about peoples and societies in the past. I'll give you a brief example of what a scientific excavation to recover and record contexts as well as objects can tell us about a single mound in the Inland Delta, while remembering that there are thousands of mounds there, each with histories that can be recovered if the deposits are not too disturbed by looting. The Mound of Jenny Geno, one of dozens in the immediate vicinity of the town of Jenny, visible in the background. This is, as I've labeled here, a man-made landscape. Uh, virtually everything that you see here with vegetation on it is an anthropogenically or human-created mound for habitation in the past. Uh, Jenny Jenna is a very large occupation mound or tell. Um, the intensity of its occupation can be seen in the thick carpet of potsherds on the surface, those ones that the French colonial administrators could not be bothered with. And it measures uh, about six meters, uh, 18 to 20 feet in height. And those six meters represent 1500 years of accumulation and deposits containing evidence of how people lived, ate, traded, consumed pottery styles, metal, created it, used it, discarded it, and how they were buried throughout this time frame. We can trace the development of the mound as people built houses first out of mud plastered thatch, then mud brick made from floodplain clay head portered up from the floodplain. And this is what contributed to the accumulation of the mound as houses were lived in and then abandoned. We now know that the cylindrical bricks that are the hallmark of Jenny Masons historically go back to 900 CE and the houses at that time were round. A couple of centuries later, influence from the north, either in, Sahara, either in the Sahara or North Africa, is evidenced by a shift to rectilinear buildings, still built with cylindrical bricks. New technologies like spinning and weaving are indicated by the appearance of spindle whirls. Uh, they're shown here on a modern woven blanket from Jenny. This is not an archaeological textile. And alas, we did recover uh, from a secondary context, buried in a pit for reasons we have no idea of the motives for. Um, one of the most spectacular examples of terracotta statuary. And it is um, kind of the crown jewel of the National Museum of Bamako, but alas, it means that inadvertently um, and unwillingly, we have contributed to the mania for these statuettes as people hope to find something of comparable quality. We have context for urn burials and have learned that an urn could contain remains of one or two people uh, who might be inter interred at different times. And some urns similar to the ones in the 2009 shipment sat on beautifully executed potsherd pavements. And we finally get some clue as to how some of the terracottas were used. The kneeling style seems to involve votive style deposits either buried under house floors here. This statuette was found under the house floor with pot lids with relief figures of a headless human and a snake. And that context was dated. And then we have another case of kneeling statuettes that are in a niche in a house foundation. And you see the little square platform here, the niche. Here are the two statuettes side by side and the wall was built up around them. They might've been accessible from the inside of the house. 
Of the over 1,000 so-called Jenny Terracottas known to be in collections, fewer than a dozen come from known contexts in authorized excavations. Most of these are from my and Rod McIntosh's excavations in concert with Malian collaborators. So in summary, the example of Mali has, I hope, demonstrated how the long contentious process of implementing the CPIA in the US has produced over time significant improvements in process, such as provenance research and ethical curation uh, codes, and has made repatriation easier to accomplish and more common. The current wave of repatriations is significantly enabled by this history. It is, however, sadly the case that, as welcome as these, repar as these reparations are, they can never repair the social fabric that was rent in Benin City and countless other locations in Africa by the desecration of shrines and dispossession by violence or other means of sacred, royal, and ancestral material culture. The violence and the damage can be redressed potentially, but never undone. And so it is with the archeological heritage. Repatriation cannot repair the damage done to sites by looting, nor secure for us the precious evidence for Africa's pre-colonial past that was destroyed in the process. Future prospects for expanding our knowledge of the past in the Inland Delta and elsewhere depend on the international will to step up prohibitions on trafficking looted antiquities. We used to be able to gauge the magnitude of the problem by looking at dealer websites to see what was for sale. It was that open. But thanks to the success of the CPIA, restricted materials do not appear. The trade I fear has gone underground, perhaps to the dark web. With this new phase emphasizing the return of cultural material of cultural materials uh, to Africa, I will hope that we will not fail to give due attention to the threats to the archeological heritage that persist in West Africa. Thank you.